Hello and welcome to Music Elements, a step-by-step -step guide to understanding music notation, leading through to chords, harmony, and potentially songwriting. So uh, it's a step-by-step -step course uh, done in 10 minute, small parts at a time. The, uh, the idea is that you re-watch, um, preview it over and over, um, each of the little 10 minute segments, um, and take in the full understanding before moving to the next class, the next lesson. Um, if you follow it this method, um, you'll be reading music and understanding it in no time at all. Music is written on a series of five lines. These are called the staff or stave. And this is where we write our music notes. To show where in pitch, so to have them written as high notes or low notes, we use a different sign at the beginning of the staff. That sign called a treble clef. The treble clef indicates higher notes. The other sign that we use is called a bass clef. So we have the treble clef and we have the bass. The treble clef indicates the notes that are being used in the higher parts of music. The bass clef indicates notes that are written down in the lower part. Treble clef Bass clef. Treble for higher, bass for lower. Treble clef is usually used for vocal, for voice, um, for higher instruments such as the flute, violin, clarinet, piccolo. Bass clef is used for lower sounding instruments such as cello, trombone, tuba, all the lower, deeper instruments, bass guitar, all play music from the bass clef. When writing the music, of course we have our five lines. In between each line, we have what we call a space. So the music writing, the staff, the stave, we have line, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line. If we need to write higher or lower notes, other than what we write on here, we can start writing little lines up above the music, or below. They're called ledger lines. We will talk about those in more detail later on. So with the five lines and the four spaces, it's almost like your hand. So we have one, two, three, four, five lines and one, two, three, four spaces. To start with, we'll just deal and just talk with and about notes in the treble. So using the treble clef for the higher pitched notes, that's where we'll start. When you write a note, it's just like a circle. There are different ones, but the body of the note is a circle, which indicates on what line or space the note is. So we have a circle there.
And there's the five lines with a note on each. The musical alphabet starts at A and runs through to G. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Then it starts back again at A. So it's a continuous loop. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It just keeps going around. And each time the note steps up, it gets higher. Or if you reverse the alphabet, we go down. So we have G, F, E, D, C, B, A, G, and then it loops around again. So the letters. The bottom line in treble clef is E. The next one up is G. The next one is B. The next one is D. Top line is F. E, G, B, D, F. Okay? We might take them out of there and put them up closer to the notes. Might be make it a little bit easier to, to read just for this example. So we have E. G, B, D, and up on the top, F. E, G, B, D, F. So you can make a rhyme from it, if you like. Um, when I was learning, I often found it quite difficult to remember a rhyme. Just remember the letters, E, G, B, D, F. Um, there's lots of rhymes that people have made up over the years. Probably the most common one and the one that works quite well um, because it also relates to the bass clef in a way is every, so there's the E, good, G, boy, deserves fruit. Every good boy deserves fruit. There are lots of them that you can make up. Um, Ernie goes boating during February. Elephants great, big, dirty feet. Every good boy drives Ferraris. There are lots of them. Every good boy deserves fruit is a really good one, as you will see later on when we do the bass clef, because it's um, very, it's very similar to a rhyme that you can have for the left hand. Now, as I said before, in the middle, we have a space. So a note sits in between each line. So it literally goes line, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line, and like with the little lines you can use above, it continues. Space, line, space, line, space, and goes up. So looking at the letters there for the spaces, you don't have to remember a rhyme for this one. It's really easy. It's simply F-A-C-E, spells a word, and that is face. F-A-C-E, face. So what I was saying about before, with the way that the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, F, G, is a continuous loop, here it is. E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it'll be on the top and it continues. Beneath the bottom line, E, we go down, we put one under the line, that becomes D, because that's what is before E, and of course what's before D? C. And there's the use of the little ledger line that we call it, where we start to recreate the staff lines by writing single little lines down as we get lower or above as we get higher. The one that I've written over here on its own little line, C, most people refer to that as middle C. You've probably heard that before, no doubt. Um, and that indicates, if you're playing the piano, 
Um, essentially, it indicates the fact that that's the C that's approximately around the middle of the piano. Middle C. And it steps up from there. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F. G would be on top. A on the next ledger line. And up we go. And that's essentially it. That's the treble clef. So if you're singing, or if you're playing a, a flute or a violin or something like that, um, and it's also like the, the right hand melody part of the piano. So the melody of a song, the tune, the melody part, um, is always written in the treble clef. Sometimes you may see it a little bit of um, melody drop down to the, to the bass if it's like for four part singing, four part harmony. But usually it is in the treble clef up in the, the melody, the higher notes. Okay. E, G, B, D, F, F, A, C, E. That's what you need to work on. So please rerun this video. Go over the lines. E, G, B, D, F, every good boy deserves fruit, and the spaces face, F, A, C, E. Once you grasp the concept of how music is notated, it's then very, very simple, the, the next process. Um, and all of this, of course, leads to an understanding of, of music writing, music reading, because music is basically... A form of language of course which has been handed down to us over the last thousand years or more uh, music notation um, and it's something that will live throughout history whatever song we write today just like the classical composers did hundreds of years ago um, we're still able to perform that we're still able to understand the writing how the music was able to be um, played what instrument the emotions the speed tempo, all sorts of things are actually written into the music, which we will talk about in a lot more detail um, down the track. So please leave some comments below if you have any questions and um, study, 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 study guys. That's all it is. Five lines, four spaces, musical alphabet, A to G, and then it just loops. Hi and welcome to Lesson 2, The Bass Clef. As we just learned, music is written on a series of five lines. Called the staff. We've already seen the treble clef, which is used for the right hand, if you're playing a keyboard instrument, piano, or keyboard, etc. Treble clef, is, of course, is um, used for the higher notes, the treble part. So if you're singing, you would be reading from the treble clef. Bass clef, often used, of course, for left-handed piano, and bass meaning the lower notes, the deeper parts of the piano. Instruments that use bass clef, of course, are things like bass guitar, cello, tuba, all of the low bass instruments. Um, if you're singing, of course, you would have to be like a bass, um, or a tenor, um, which is singing down lower, in the lower parts. Five lines and four spaces, just like we had in treble clef. The lines. The spaces. With the treble clef, the lines were E, G, B, D, F, and of course, if you use the rhyme, every good boy deserves fruit, you can use a similar rhyme for the bass clef to help you remember 
the letter names of the notes. With bass clef, we actually start with G. B, D, F, A. Good, boys, deserve, fruit, always. Good boys deserve fruit always. So if you use that rhyme in the treble clef, you can use a variation of it for the bass clef. G, B, D, F, A. There are lots of other rhymes you can use, of course, um, but we'll just focus on this one because it's very similar to the treble clef. So this would be good boys deserve fruit always. Spaces. A, C, E, and G. A, C, E, G. All cows eat grass. Like I said with treble clef, if you're a rhymes person, it's very easy to remember these rhymes. Good boys deserve fruit always. And all cows eat grass. Very easy to remember them. I remember when I was learning, I found it uh, much easier just to remember G, B, D, F, A and A, C, E, G uh, rather than remembering rhymes for letters. But um, totally up to you which way you prefer to learn and remember the notes. <coughs> remember we have the five lines. One, two, three, four, five. In between each line we have a space. Bass clef. For the bass, the lower notes. Treble clef was used for the higher notes. Bass clef used for instruments like bass guitar, tuba, things like that, cello. Treble clef is used for the higher, the treble. Instruments such as voice, flute, violin, clarinet, instruments like that. Bass clef. The staff of five lines or stave. The lines, G, B, D, F, A. Good boys deserve fruit always. In the spaces, A, C, E, G. <clears throat> Now, like I explained with treble clef, the notes do go higher and lower. When they go higher, we use ledger lines, which go up and up and up. Really what you're doing is replicating the five lines in a continuation above. Sitting on the top line, just like the musical alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, line, space, line, space, line, space, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B would sit on the top line, C, then D. <clears throat> this C here is what we call middle C. Essentially, we have treble clef above the bass, and that middle C, C note here is exactly the same pitch and the same note as the one I've just drawn there in treble clef. That note is middle C. You can kind of see now probably why it's called middle C. It's also the C that's closest to the middle on the piano keyboard, but it's the C that sits in the middle area between treble and bass clef. This C here is exactly the same note, the same pitch, just like I played on the piano, as this note in bass clef. <coughs> Both clefs now would then be joined, lines at the front, and you can see then E on the line, which we just learned in triple clef in the last lesson, D 
D below, C, B, A, G, F, and it literally now becomes five lines, five lines, an imaginary 11th line running through the middle, which we call middle C, which is this one here, if it's written in left hand, bass clef. This version, if it's written right hand, upper parts of the piano, in treble clef. So now what we've done is we've actually joined our five lines in the treble to five lines in the bass, and we have what we call now the great staff, is when we have five and the five, and they're actually joined at the front with a bar line, double bar line, thick line. And you normally see this fancy thing, which I can't draw, a brace. It's called at the beginning. So when we put the two together, five and five, treble and bass, we end up with 10 lines, imaginary middle C line running through the middle there that we just draw the line when we need to write that note. Okay. G, B, D, F, A. A, C, E, G. All cows eat grass. Good boys deserve fruit always. The five lines for the treble clef. That we've done. And we have five lines at the top and the treble, the high notes. Then we have the five lines with the bass clef that we did in lesson two. Combining them with a line and a fancy bracket loop at the front, we now have what we call the great staff or the great stave, which consists of five lines up here, of course in the treble clef, Five lines in bass clef combined together to form ten lines. Of course, what we mentioned in last lesson was this little imaginary line that runs through the middle here. And when we use that line, we write what we call a ledger line. So it's just a little line that the note goes on. That particular note, as we know, is called middle C. Writing it up here, close to the treble clef lines, means it's played in the higher end. So if you're playing piano, you'd be playing that with your right hand. If we write like this, that means it's closer to the left hand, so the bass clef, so that would be played with the left hand. So you can see they're exactly, they look different, but they're actually exactly the same note. The only difference is, again, if you're playing a keyboard instrument, one is played with right hand, the other one here is played with left hand because it's written closer to the left, the bass clef staff. This one is written closer to the right, the treble stave. Now, if we write all the notes out, like we've done before, and on the top line, F. And of course, running through here, Oh, 
Okay, as we've learned in previous lessons, we have uh, the notes written, so this one is E, F in the space, G on the line, A in the space, B, C, D, E, F. Remember the lines? Every good boy deserves fruit, and the spaces, F, A, C, E, spell face. Left hand, or bass clef, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, top line, A. Good, boys deserve fruit always. A, C, E, G, all cows eat grass. If you were using the rhymes, as I said before, I preferred to just learn the letters, E, G, B, D, F, and F, A, C, E. Um, or GBDFA and ACEG. Uh, when I was learning, I found it much easier just to learn the letters. Um, I found it difficult, you had to learn a rhyme to then learn the, the first letter of each word in the rhyme to then know the lines or spaces. So you may find it a lot easier just to learn the letters. Now, linking these, the great stave. We have A, top line, E, bottom line in treble, how do we join them? Well, we've got this imaginary line running through the middle, remember? There's C. One above C between this line and this line is this little space here, D. This line and this line, the top line, there's this space here, which is B. So we now have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then it loops. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. A, B, C, D, E, F. G would be on the top line. Little ledger line going up. A, B, two lines. C, D, and so on. As we get higher and higher and higher, that's the same as you go lower. Here's G on the bottom line. Under the line would be F, going backwards through the alphabet, F, first ledger line down here, E, next one, under the line, D, two lines, low C. So you can see how the five lines in treble, five lines in bass, now come together to form the grand staff, or as I said before, the grand stave. I just grab a piece of random music, which is What a Wonderful World. Okay. We can see here, we have treble, bass, joined together by the lines, the braces at the beginning. Exactly what we've just been talking about. The only difference on this music is it has an extra treble clef. And of course that has the words, the melody for the singer or the instrumentalist that's playing. Below that, we have the piano accompaniment, which goes to the melody line on top. The bracketed part, piano, treble bass. Single part at the top here, vocal line. You can also see it's got words. And if we have another close look and look at other things that are on the page, we have chord symbols on top, B flat, A minor, G minor 7 chords. That's what these little letters are for. Below that, in tiny little writing, we have the guitar fretboard. So for guitarists who want to know the exact inversion of a B flat chord, it's actually written there with little dots on the frets, the strings. Okay, so you can see that that is identical to what we were talking about here. Treble, bass, joining them together, bracket, so that they're played together. It's the same instrument. That is if it's for a piano, keyboard. Okay, so that's what's called the grand stay. So please take note of all of the letter names, musical alphabet, runs from A to G, like we've spoken about before. 
and then it just loops A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and just keeps going round and round and round. Once you grasp where the notes sit on the stave, on the five lines, in the treble, once you get the idea of that and memorize that, left hand or the bass clef section is relatively easy. Um, and then it's just progressing forward from there with the um, other musical elements that go together, like some of the chords and the lines and things like that I just showed you on that piece of music. So study that guys, and um, we'll come back for the next um, session very soon. Music note values. You may have seen on the music that I showed you in the previous lesson, um, all the dots, dots on lines on paper. <laughs> That's all music is. But you can see there's all sorts of different ones. Some have stems, some are just circles, some have little tails, some are colored in, some are not colored in. Um, they're all different types of music notes and each note lasts for a different length of time. So if we start at the very top, this particular note here called a semi-breathe. I'll use the traditional English um, names for these notes. Uh, there's also the American equivalent which is a, a fraction sort of breakdown um, for the name of the note. So, so that would actually be called a whole note if we we're using the Americanized names for the notes. Um, I'll just use the traditional English names. So that's a semi-breathe and it's worth four counts. So you would hold a note like this. One, two, three, four, then let go. So if you were singing, you would la to hold the note, singing it for one, two, three, four, then you release the note. A semi breathe. Below a semi breathe, if we break a semi breathe in half, we end up with these guys. Circle with a stem. Okay, so what's half of four? Half of four is two. Okay, they're called. Minimum. So you would go one, two, one, two. So it would sound like this. One, two, one, two. So you would hold the note for two counts, two beats. Dividing these guys in half, the minims in half, we color them in with a stem. Exactly the same as the ones above, except they're coloured in. They're worth one. Count each. One plus one equals two. Two plus two equals four. So each line here equals four. So you can see here, with these notes, called a crotchet, it would take four of those to equal the top note semi-brief. And they would sound like this. One, 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 one. So you would play four of those to equal up here. Two equal a minimum. Two minims equal semi-brief. Now we can go down further, which is what this music does. We um, normally go down to a note, there's one, right there with a little tail. Okay, this is the music, what a wonderful world. Now, that one sits here. So we've got tail, crotchet, 
but it's got a tail. Okay, and they're all coloured in. And they're called a quaver. What's half of one? Half. So, a quaver is worth half. Two quavers together equal a crotchet. One bead. Two crotchets together, a minim, worth two. Two minims together equal semi-brief worth four. When you write two quavers together, side by side, you normally join the little tails across. Just like here in the music. And up here, what a wonderful world. What a, see up here? The two tails are joined across the top and joining them together. Just makes it easier when you're reading music to see the tails joined, so you can see that that half plus half equals one. Rather than seeing half, 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 and then trying to add them all together to form whole beats rather than half beats. The only one missing there, of course, one, two, four, is of course something worth three. So I might just write it on the side here. The note worth three would sit in here, and it's a minim with a dot. Dotted minim. Okay, and it's worth three. So that's the note table, the note chart, the value of notes. We have semi brave at the top worth four. Just a circle, four. Minim, circle with a stem, worth two. Crotchet, coloured in, stem, worth one. Quaver, coloured in, stem, and a tail, worth half. And of course, when you put two quavers, four quavers together, um, there are different rules as far as joining them together. Uh, we can talk about that a bit later. But when they're joined together, two of them, we use this little, the tails, we now call when they're joined, that line across the top is called a beam. So when you join them together, they're beamed together. Half, two of them make one, two ones make two, two twos make four, the top note. So go over that chart, look at them, maybe write out, um, which I'll do on the next screen here, um, and you can then go through and put some note values and try and work out some of the note values. So if I get rid of this. Okay. Well, let's try this. So we have this note. Okay. 30 seconds to work out the values of the notes. That was a quick 30 seconds. <laughs> More like 10. <laughs> this one here is called a semi brief If you write down four, you're correct. This one's a minim, worth two. Crotchet, worth one. Quaver, worth half. Dotted minim, worth three. Fantastic. Let's try one more quick little exercise. <clears throat> this one's a little bit harder.
There we go. So we're adding the notes together. We want to know exactly what note would be the answer, as in what it looks like, and also the name of the note. A few seconds there just to see if you can work them out. Okay, the first one, here we go. That's a crotchet worth one, crotchet worth one, one plus one is two, and the note looks like that. A minim. Down here we've got a crotchet one, a minim two. Add them together, three. The note looks like dotted minim. Minim worth two, minim worth two, two plus two is four. And the note is a semi brief. And the last one, crotchet worth one, crotchet worth one, minim worth two, one plus one is two, plus two is four. And the note, semi brief again. Fantastic. So go back through the note chart that we did with the value and the names of the notes, um, semi-brief, minim, crotchet, quaver. Study that and um, I'll catch you in the next lesson for some more advanced note tables and we'll be introducing the rests as well. So thanks guys, I'll see you in the next lesson. Okay, let's do a bit of a recap. What were the five lines called that we write music on? It's called the staff or stave. The sign for the upper notes. Treble clef. Awesome. I'm going to write a few notes and you have to see if you can work out what the names of them are. Okay, first one, E. Second one, second line, G. First space, F. Middle line, B. Remember, every, second line, G, good. Boy, deserves fruit. And the first space is F. And if you're remembering the rhyme, F, A, C, E spells the word face. Five lines, staff, this one right here. Bass clef, meaning the lower part. If you're playing piano or keyboard, that means usually using the left hand. Some notes. What are the letter names of the notes? A, B, C, G, F. Remember the spaces? All, cows eat grass, A, C, E, G. And the lines, good boys deserve fruit. Top line would be A for always. Five lines, the notes that we've just um, covered in lesson four. I'll just do them on a staff here. I'll just put a treble clef and let's go. How many counts or the value of that note there? Okay, so not the fact that it's F. We want to know the value as a number. Okay, I'll write a few different notes. Don't do the stems quite that long.
Okay, a couple of minutes just to work them out. Here we go. First one. Just a circle is worth four counts. It's called a semi breve. Coloured in with a stem is worth one. Called a crotchet. Not coloured in, but has a stem of course. Minim, worth two. Coloured in, stem and tail is half. It's called a quaver. And a dotted minim. So it's one of these guys with a dot worth three. You going well at home? Let's do a couple more. Triple clef, here we go. The letter name of these notes. Go. First one, one, two, three, fourth line. Every good boy, D, deserves. Third space, F-A-C-E, so that's a C, face. Every good b boy, every good g, good, and the first space, F A C E F. Okay, so the rhyme does come in handy if you've learnt them by rhyme. I find them better, as I've said many times, just to learn exactly what line and what letter sits on the line. Bass clef. There we go, see if you can work those out. Okay, bottom line in bass clef is G. Good B boys B. Good boys deserve fruit always. Second space, all c cows eat grass. So it's a C. Bottom line again, it's a line. So good. Boys deserve fruit always. That's D. All cows eat grass. E. And good. Boys deserve fruit always. F. B, C, D, E, F. Again, if you're using rhymes, that's great. If you're not using rhymes and you're just going straight to remember the letters, that's fantastic as well. Okay, here we go. Some notes. Do you remember what that one was called? It's called a semi breve and it's worth four counts. Minim and it's worth two. Crotch it. Worth one. Quaver. Looks like a crotchet with a tail. Half a beat. And the very last one is a dotted minim. So it's a minim with a dot. How did you go? I hope you did well on the recap. Go back over this video, go through the notes, the note values, the treble clef, the bass clef notes, and of course the charts that we've done in the previous video and this one now of the note values. Catch you in the next lesson. time signatures and bar lines. We've covered uh, the value of notes in uh, a previous tutorial. Um, now we're going to be talking about the numbers that you'll see written at the beginning of a piece of music. Um, there's all different types of numbers like this that we call a time signature. We have four, four, three, four, two, four, 
many others. That's what we call simple type. You have more complicated ones um, such as 6, 8, 9, 8, etc. Um, you don't see too many of those in modern music. They're more of a classical time signature, classical music, um, and such were written in those sorts of time signatures, as well as these. The most common time signature of all, 4-4. Four, four. It can also be represented um, on music, written as the letter C, for common, common time signature. Okay, so if we have our five lines that music's written on, we have our treble clef, bass clef, if we had a bass clef line would be underneath, and the time signature sits right at the beginning. 4-4 four, four we will deal with today. So that means that there are four beats in every bar. A bar are the lines that come down dividing up our music. This little piece here, this little piece here, this little piece here, is what we call a bar of music. It divides up the song into the time. You can see the bar lines coming down, dividing up the music. Right here. You can see one here. See one at the end of the line, of course. Another little line there, another line there, another line there. So it divides up the music into bars. Bar of music. Four beats in the bar. Remember we have done notes such as the semi-brief, which equals four counts. We did that in the previous tutorial. So you could have one of those notes sitting here, and that would fill up the whole bar. So you'd play the note or sing the note, and it'd be one, two, three, four, lift off onto the next note. You may have um, the minims that we did. They're worth two beats each. So we might put two of them in here. One, two, three, four, then off. One, two, three, four, that one's worth. Okay. The other note that we've done, of course, is the crotchet. Coloured in stem equals one. So you may have to have four of those in the bar to fill up four counts. One, two, three, four. So the three bars that I've just written there would sound like this if it was played. You'd have one, two, three, four. One, two. One, two, one, two, three, four. So I can hear some notes last much longer, some are very short. This one is one, two, three, four, then off. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, four. Okay. So, if we then and of course that can also be written down in the uh, bass clef, which if you had the grand stave with five and five, you'd have your treble clef here, you'd have your bass clef for the lower notes if you're playing keyboard, of course, they're joined together in the funny bracket thing, um, the brace, and we have four, four, and of course at the beginning here we have four, four. So that's what music would look like if you had the two staves playing. So you would have, if you're playing keyboard, right and left hand. Up here, you may have a melody note. You may have just a simple bass note or something like that playing down there. It just depends what song it is and how it's written, of course. Music is different for different songs of course. Here we have a piece of music and this displays exactly what we've just been talking about. You have 4-4 four, four written at the beginning there, treble, bass, the brace, 4 and 4. Treble clef, the melody, the high part, 
and then the base clef, the low part, and you can see that the time signature is only written at the beginning of the song. See that? It's not on every line. It's only at the beginning. And that sets the time, the, the beats per bar for the entire song. Don't get the time signature confused with how fast one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, or one, two, three, four. Don't get that confused with how fast a piece of music is played. Normally, you will have written at the top here, um, played to be played uh, at a moderate speed, to be played slowly, to be played fast. Sometimes they're written um, in English words like moderate, fast, slow, things like that. Um, usually they're written in an Italian, um, the traditions of music. So you might have something like moderato. No guess, <laughs> no second guess is what that one means in English. <laughs> moderate. Um, you may have things like adagio or allegro, um, andantino, things like that. Um, some of those um, terms mean to play it at a slow, easy pace. Allegro means you play it at a fast speed. Um, and they would be written at the top here of how fast to play it. Sometimes you might also find what we call a metronome mark, um, which tells you how many beats are in each bar. So, uh, the speed, sorry. So here we'll have a crotchet equals, and just for in interest, 120. So that means you will have 120 crotchet beats per minute, not not per bar, it tells you how many per minute. Now, you can sit down mathematically and work that out to how many bars, how many notes <coughs> of, a, of a crotchet um, fall within a minute. But if you think about it, this may sound complicated, but it's actually not. If we had crotchet equals 60, every time the second hand on your clock or watch ticks, that's a beat. 60 seconds in a minute, and if we had crotchet equals 60, that would be one beat every second. So it would literally be one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, seven, eight, counting through to 60 seconds in a minute, okay. So putting that into a time here, for instance, one, two, three, four, the speed these notes would be played would be one per second. One, two, three, four. So every second is a beat. So 120, 60 plus 60 equals 120. So this speed up here is twice as fast as 60. So it would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So it'd be a lot faster, it'd be double the speed. So don't get the time signature confused with how fast a song goes. The tempo speeds are normally written at the top. And that tells you just how fast the song's going to move along. So beats in the bar, time signatures, will mainly be dealing with four, four time, easy one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And if you reference back to the previous tutorial about note values, um, and then watch, replay that one, watch this one, and alternate between the two over the next couple of days with the note values and how the notes then fall into a bar of music. Bar line, another bar, another bar, bar line. Um, and how the notes are then put together. And that's why the notes have a, a different value. Some are worth one, some are worth two, some are worth four, where they then last for the entire bar. Um, and that's time signatures. There's a lot more to come with time signatures, but that's a very basic lead in to give you an idea of how to put the notes into bars of music.
Welcome to Music Elements. You may notice now that we've moved from a whiteboard to what we call manuscript paper. Manuscript paper um, is basically what music's written on. You can see there it's a series of five lines like we've been talking about and it's just printed onto paper. Like when you're doing um, writing um, or assignments for school or university you use the blue lined paper to write your assignments and, and things onto. With music, we use what we call manuscript paper, which as I said, is just a series of the five lines, the staff, just like we've um, been doing over the last few tutorials. So moving on with what we've done, we will progress onto this type of paper from, from now. So going back to what we've already done, treble clef, higher notes, bass clef, Lower notes. We put the brace at the front. My poorly drawn brace. The lines that come down and divide the music. Remember what we've called them? They're called bar lines. And they divide the music up into bars of music. At the end of a song, uh, or a piece, we have what we call a double bar line. The double bar line is a thick and a thin bar line at the end, which is right there. You can see the thick line and the thin line compared to just the thin normal bar line that we use throughout the music. So at the end of a song, it is a thicker double line, like that. And that represents the end of the song. Think of a double bar line as a full stop. The end of the song, end of a sentence, end of a, end of a book. It's the end of the story. That's the end of the song. Going on also from what we learned in the last tutorial about time signatures, we will put a four and a four here. And of course, another 4-4 four, four. in the bass clef. So now we're starting to look like a piece of music. We have our time signatures. The piece of music is in four. We have a treble for the higher notes. If you were playing piano, which is what this music's written for, um, you have the treble clef for the higher notes. You have the bass clef for the low, the lower notes. Remember, treble clef are for the higher notes Bass clef is for the lower, the lower notes. You also use bass clef for um, the harmony, you can use it for chords, you can use it for all sorts of things. Melody in the top, chords harmony in the bass. The beats that fit into a bar in 4-4 time, we can have semi-brief, which we, if you remember from the last tutorial, is worth four counts. One, two, three, four, then you release the note. Also filling up a bar would be two of those. That's a minimum worth two beats. So you would play one, two, one, two, release. Dividing that up again, we have the colored in with the stem. Worth one beat, so it'd be one, 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 one. One, two, three, four in the bar. And something a little bit different, we'll have one of those there with one and the dotted minimum worth three. So this rhythm would be one, one, two, three, off. Counting in four, four time, it would be one, two, three, four, off. So putting the counting in there would be one, two, three, four, one, two, that one comes on three, holds for four, one, two, three, four. 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 Let go. Okay? So that's how you're fitting the notes into the bars in on the stave <laughs> and of course the double bar line. So this, the rhythm of that song, if you were to put it into a note, to a frequency, to 
a sound would literally be one, two, three, four, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, the end. That's it, lift the note off. Because of the double bar line means the finish, the end. As well as notes that we've discussed in the last tutorial and now again in this one, we also have rests. Now a rest tells you to do exactly that, to rest, to not sing a note, to not play a note for whatever beat the rest is worth. So you can have a rest worth four, you can have a rest worth two, you can have a rest worth one, um, and it's not making a sound for that beat. So the semi-brief rest, I'll just write them down below here, hangs from a line like a little block, like a little bucket. Um, holding something so it's coming downward from that line and that tells you to not play anything not make a sound for four beats it's called a semi brief rest it also has another name called a whole bar rest because it's telling you not to play anything for the whole bar it's worth four counts and when you put it into a bar of four four there's no other note can fit in there so it's called a whole bar rest the semi brief rest can also be used in any other time signature. So if you've got three beats in the bar, two beats, you can have six eight time. If there's no notes in the bar, that is then called a whole bar rest, where it's filling up the entire bar, telling you not to play anything. A minimum rest. A minimum rest looks like a semi brief but the other way around. So it's sitting on the line going upward, not coming down. Okay, so if you were to put a minimum here, and then the minimum rest would be sitting on that line right there. Okay, I can't put two minimum rests in here, in the bar, because that would be musically incorrect. Because there's a whole bar rest, I can't put multiple rests. I would need to put one of these in every bar telling you that there was nothing playing. But what I can do is do this. I can put a uh, minimum here and put a minimum rest there. So that tells you to rest for two beats and then play a note for two beats. And two plus two equals the four, four. A crotchet rest looks like a Z and a C like that. A little bit difficult to draw, but that's what they look like. And it would be the same thing here. You would need to put, um, for instance, say a note, then the crotch at rest, like that. So you can see one note on, rest, boom, rest, boom, rest, that type of thing. Okay? To add up to three, you would need to put a minimum and then a crotchet, two plus one, or one plus two, depending how the beats fall in the bar. Um, modern music, you uh, can use a dotted minimum rest. However, uh, to see the beats clearly, um, you would normally write it as two crotchets, in this case, and then a minimum. So, for instance, you would have um, something like, say, if you want to note there, for instance, boom, and then that would be a crotchet in the bar. Then you'd need your second crotchet on the beat, then the minimum rest sitting on the line. So the two crotchets, one plus one, plus the one sitting on the line's worth two. One plus one plus two equals four. Gets you back to four beats in the bar. Um, we've got four, four on each line. Every bar throughout an entire song even the left hand has to have four beats. Think of them as two different parts. Think of that as like a flute and that as like a bass guitar. Or a soprano singing and a bass down low singing. They each need their line of music with the correct amount of beats in each bar, including rests. Okay, so going back to the very first tutorial, treble clef, higher notes, bass clef, lower notes, Five lines that music's written on, when it's on paper, like this, we call that 
manuscript paper. You can see clearly the five lines. The lines coming down, dividing up the music, are called bar lines. They divide the music into bars of music. The thick and thin one at the end is a double bar line, and that tells you that it's the end of the song. Finish, don't play any more. There's usually no more notes after that anyway. <laughs> it's the end of the song. Back to note values and the name of notes. This is extremely important. Uh, extremely important that you memorize this table. Uh, probably not so much the actual names, in particular the names down here. These are the more commonly used names. Um, but it's extremely important that you relate the actual note with the value of the note. So we'll run through this now again. We have the note here, the semi-brief. Semi-brief. It's also called a whole note, and semi-brief is the, note that's, uh, the name that's used more frequently. Um, and it holds for four beats. So the note plays and holds for four counts. One, two, three, four, then it releases. A minimum, half note, two beats. So it plays for one, two, then let go. Crotchet, coloured in with a stem, crotchet quarter note, one beat, so it's just one, one, one. Quaver, like a crotchet with a little tail, eighth note, it's worth half a beat. Semi-quaver, you can see we just add a tail to it, sixteenth note, it's worth a quarter of one beat. <clears throat> so it takes four of these to add up to one crotchet, which is worth one beat. So if you look right down the bottom here, four of them, normally join their tails together, equals one beat. So four semi-quavers equals one. The quaver with half of one, so it's like a crotchet with a little tail. You need two of those, we just join the tails, two quavers equals one beat, which is the same as the crotchet. The crotchet, we would need two crotchets, two times one, to give the minimum. The minimum, we would need two minims, side by side, two beats each, two plus two equals four. So two minims equal the semi-brief. Two crotchets equals one minim. Two quavers equals a crotchet. Two semi-quavers equals a quaver. And yes, it does get down further down to even smaller notes. Every time we have a smaller note, which would be the next one down on the scale, we just add an extra tail. So we have three tails or four tails. You don't see them very often. Um, semi-brief, four, minimum, two, crotchet, one, quaver, half. They're the most important ones. And of course, the one that doesn't fit evenly into here is the minimum with a dot beside it, which we've discussed in previous tutorials. The minimum with a dot, it's called a dotted minimum, and it receives three counts. So it's like having three of these, three ones, or two, and the dot with the extra crotchet, two plus one equals three. So please go over this um, little chart, little guide here, and go over and over those note values and what they're called, because it's really important, as you saw in the last tutorial that we did, where the notes and bars work in with a time signature, and you can see the different notes, bar lines, and how the different notes fit into each bar, and of course the rests that we also talked about. One's hanging from the line, one's sitting on a line, and of course the little zigzag one, the crotchet rest, with one beat. But the note table here is extremely important 
to go over so you know exactly what the notes look like for when you're writing them and then of course the values of each of the notes. Okay, let's apply everything that we've learned so far in all of the tutorials and apply it to this beautiful piece of music by Australian composer Bruce Rollin. Um, so you can look at the beginning. So let's start there. Treble clef. Bass clef. The joint at the front with the line and the brace. So that means that both of these lines, because they are joined with the brace and the lines going all the way through, they're played at the same time. So not too hard to guess that this is piano music. Um, the next that comes in, next part that comes in from the treble and bass is of course the time signature, which you can see there is 4-4. Four, four. We have the five lines of course, for the bass and five for the treble. This being on piano, of course, the top line here, treble clef is played with the right hand, bass clef, of course, is played with the left hand. We have the lines coming down through the music, bar lines. You can see them. They divide the music into, a piece there, a bar of music. These little lines here that I've drawn in at some point in time. Um, the thicker line and the thin line with the little dots. And you can see this one here is around the other way. So it's like a set of brackets coming in either side of the music. That is the repeat sign. So you would play through, see this one? And you go right back to either the beginning or the repeat sign that's the opposite, like I've ruled in here to show you that the dots around the other way. So you play through and repeat, play those two again. So one, two, two bars actually becomes one, two, three, four bars long. That's the introduction. The song actually then starts here. Here the little squiggly sign, crotchet rest, we've done. We have a note here, minim with two counts. You can see here we've got our little Quaver. There's three notes playing at the same time there. You can see the stem and how three notes are connected to that stem. And it's got a little tail. So that is a quaver with half a beat. We've then got another two quavers because their tails are joined. And then we've got a group of four. Group of four quavers, group another four quavers. Remember, two quavers equals one beat. So you can see here that that would be beat one, beat two, two of them. Beat three, two joined together. Beat four, another two joined together. Another little single quaver down here in the left hand. And so on. Here we've got a circle. No stem. That's a semi brief worth four counts. It's got the little line on it. So, of course, from your note names and where notes are, that note is middle C. Down here in the left, the note sitting under the bottom line. Bottom line's G. One below G, of course, in the alphabet going backwards, would be F. Little double line through. There's lower C. There's the C in the base in the left. Or cows eat grass, A, C. That's another C. Circle with a stem through. Crutch at rest. And of course, down the bottom here, we have three notes playing together, which would sound like this. Three notes playing with, not coloured in, with stem, with dots, dotted minimum. So that one would be worth three counts. You can see the coloured in notes here with a stem, crotch it, worth one. So it'd be one, two, three, four, then on to the next bar of music on the next page. Here we've got a crotchet rest, so counting would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on. So you can see how important the note values relate to the song 
and how it all then fits together. And everything we've done so far uh, in the tutorials is all there literally in black and white. One thing that um, I always teach my um, students when they're here in the studio is music and the best way I've never found in my life to describe music is simply dots on lines on paper. That's all it is. Dots on lines on paper. Now, when you open a book, a normal reading book, um, it's letters from the alphabet arranged into words, black text from letters on white on paper. Um, and it's the same here. Once you understand the, the music and the notes, where the notes are on the staff, the stave, the five lines, music suddenly becomes extremely easy. Um, it's understanding the notes, the note values that we've just gone through again, and the whole lot then comes together. So music analysis is kind of what we've just been doing here in this tutorial. It's just going over a single piece of music, showing you where the notes are sitting. You can see here, there's another low C, the bottom line in bass clef. Remember? Good boys deserve fruit always. G, G, B, D, F, A. There's the bottom line, that's a G. Steps down to F. C, F, C, F, C, boom, 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 boom. Um, and once you understand where the notes are and the reading of music, it can then progress through to all sorts of things that we'll be doing and starting in the next few tutorials. We'll be understanding chords, um, harmonies, and from there, we then move into songwriting, which will be a great tutorial to, um, to start into. So go back over the, all of the tutorials so far, the note values, note names, and particularly all of the musical theory bits that go together like bar lines, a bar of music, time signatures, which was in the last tutorial, about how many beats are in each bar and how it all comes together to give you this here. Keys, scales, chords, they're all related. When I say keys, I don't mean the keys on, the, on a keyboard. I actually mean what's referred to as the key, like the scale that a song's written in. Normally indicated at the beginning here of the song. Um, you can see that after the treble clef, or bass clef, there's actually nothing, like no sharps or flats in between that and the C for common time, the time signature. So you would say that this piece of music here is in the key of C major. So if we base today's tutorial on C major, C major from C to C is the scale, okay? C major has no accidentals, as we call these, sharps or flats. Um, it's all white keys. The scale normally spans over one octave, O-C-T-A-V-E, oct, meaning eight um, notes, in a scale. So we're race, um, basing it from C up to C. Okay, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and C. You can continue of course, D, E, F, G, going that way, and of course going down, which would then sort of fall it down into the bass clef with C, B, A, G, F, E, D, down to the lower C. Um, and that's a scale. Now, a scale um, refers to, as I, I said, a series of notes um, over the octave, so eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then there'd be another eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight to the next C, and so on. As you play different scales, or learn about different scales, keys, key signatures, um, some start to uh, have the black notes. Um, F major, for instance, F, G, A, B flat, C, D, E, F. 
okay? So, um, and they will be sharps or they'll be flats, depending on what the scale is, of course. Um, the scale is built up of a series of what we call tones and semitones. A tone is like that, where there is one note in between, okay? A semitone, semi meaning half, as you probably guessed, would be like that. The closest two notes can get together is a semitone. Tone is where there's one in the middle. So a scale, a major scale, is tone, tone, semitone. You can't get any closer than those two there. Tone, 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 and another semitone. So using that method, tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone, depending what note you start on, you can actually work out any scale, or any, should I say, any major scale. There's a big difference between major and the various minor scales. So like I played before, F, let's just have a look at F scale. So, we just move the camera a little bit that way. Okay, so we've got a tone, See, there's one in the middle. Another tone, there's one in the middle. A semitone, now the closest you can get. Okay. Then another tone. Well, from the black note to the white note, it's a semitone, so you have to jump it. There's a tone. You can see there's one here in the middle. Then another tone, then another tone, and finish on a semitone. So you can see that we have a black note in the scale. And there's F major. Now, as I said before, basing it on any um, scale, or starting note, which we'd call a key note, you can work out any major scale quite easily using tone, tone, semitone, tone, 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 semitone. So C major scale. From the notes from C up to C. Okay, um, within the scale we have what we call intervals or degrees of the scale. C of course, or your key note is always number one. D would be two, E would be three, F4, G5, A6, B7, and of course C to C is the octave or perfect octave. It's got a few different names you can use. Um, and that is basically how scales are formed. Now from scales, the key, the key signature, as I said before on this piece of music, um, we would have any sharps or flats written in here. Um, other pieces of music may have sharps or flats written in uh, the music. Some may have lots of sharps, some may have lots of flats. As an example, this one here, for instance, has two sharps. You can see they're written here at the beginning of the song. Okay. So this particular one has two sharps, which would put it into the key of D major. Another one here, as an example, has, oh, this is a good one, has three flats. See the three flats written here at the beginning of the line. Okay, and that would mean it would be what we call in the key of E flat major. But you don't have to worry about all that at the moment. If we can just focus on the notes of C scale. If you've got a keyboard at home, sit down, play along. Listen to each of the pitch, uh, maybe sing the note, la the note, um, hum the note as you're going through playing the different notes of the scale. Start at the top, go down, come back up, start at the bottom, and come back up and then back down again. You could do it over several octaves, so you can actually start down lower or, or up higher. So you can hear the higher pitch of the C scale and also the lower, if you want to go really low, or just from middle C down to the lower pitch C. 
Um, but everything's based on, as I said, one octave, O-C-T-A-V-E, oct, meaning eight, like an octagon has eight sides, octopus has eight legs. Um, the original calendar, October, was the eighth month. So oct meaning eight, and it's basically just the same sequence. Once you learn the patterns, uh, there's a little bit of maths and that involved in music too, I guess. But once you learn the patterns and um, how things are formed, um, music gets easier and easier, as you've probably found in the other tutorials that um, I've um, been doing over the last few weeks. Um, it just gets easier and easier. So if you can focus on that, go back over the scale of semitones, tones, semitones, semitone, tone, semitone, 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 semitone. Tone, where there's one in the middle. Semitone, where there's nothing. <laughs> you can't play a note in between the, the crack there. <laughs> like that's, that's it, that's as close as the two notes can get. That's a semitone. Um, and as I said, from there, it's just a matter of then learning the scale. We'll just focus on C. And once you get that, uh, grasp that, we can then move on to chords, which we will start to progress on to chords in the next tutorial. Once we get the chords going, um, of the major scale, we can then start looking at putting all that together with everything else we've done, note values, um, note names of course, and look at then putting it all together to how a song is formed with harmonies, with chords, and then turn that into actually writing your own song. So um, yeah, learn the scales and the notes, and we'll put it all together. C to C. Chords, also called triads. T-R-I-A-D-S, tri as in like tricycle or triangle, meaning three. So it's literally a combination of three notes played together. Going back to the C scale that um, we did in the last tutorial and just going up the notes from C over the octave, the eight notes. Um, if we give every note C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. If we give every one of those notes a number, you always count the note you start on as number one, always. So normally when you're counting, you probably only go from here and you go one, two, three, and so on. But no, this C here, number one, then D is two, E, F, G, A, B. C would be eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that's how we get the octave. The eight, oct means eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And essentially that's the C major scale. Going from C up to C. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Um, to build a chord or a triad, um, just to um, show you what, the difference between what people call a harmony and what people call chords or a triad. A harmony is any two or more notes played together. Um, it's mainly two notes forms a harmony. So if I was to play these two notes for instance, you can hear, or these two, or these two. Some harmonies sound good, some don't. <laughs> so um, two or more notes played together. Um, a chord, triad but in particular, is when you play three notes. A triad is, or a chord is normally accompanying a melody. So you may have your song and the chords play, the chord is playing. Okay, so you've got your melody up here, singing away, da 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 da, and you've got your harmony chords playing in the bass. So harmony would be when 
For instance, two people are singing, or you may have two violins playing. One's got the, the high um, melody part, and the other one might be just doing some sort of counter melody or harmony underneath. They're two completely different things. Um, so you've got the chords that we're talking about today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. <clears throat> A chord in C major scale, if we were to talk about C chord, that would be based on C. C is number one, first note. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? To form a chord, you need the first note, then the third, then the fifth. One, three, and five. So, to make C chord, C is number one, D would be two, E would be three, F's four, G five. One, three, and five. If you use your fingers, it's first, middle finger, and little finger. Thumb, three, five. And there's C chord. Easy as that. Okay? C chord in the key of C major, or scale of C. Okay? The next chord that we do in the key of C is what is called the dominant chord. The C chord is called the tonic chord, and then we move to what's called the dominant, which is a fancy word for the fifth. So we count up five notes, C, D, E, F, G. You put your thumb on that note. Then you go one, three, four, five. One, three, five is how you build a chord. One is the note you start on, then three, boom, then four, then five. G, B, and D. There's G chord. Simple as that. So we've done C chord and G chord, G, B, D. C, E, G. C chord, G, B, D. G chord. Tonic, C chord. Dominant, G chord. The next chord that we do is what we call the subdominant chord. Hyphenated word, subdominant. Sub, if you can think of any words that start with sub. Um, submarine, submarine actually means below water. Marine being water, um, the marine environment. Sub means below. Subway, as in the train terminals underground, um, meaning below the normal way people travel. It's underground, it's sub, it's below. So subdominant, if the dominant is the fifth, which it is, okay, G chord, sub, what's below G? We go back, what's below five? One, two, three, four, five. What's below five? Four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so you count four notes. We have F as our first note, the first one now. So we go one, three, four, five. One, three, five. Now we have F chord. F, A, and C, subdominant. Tonic chord, C, E, G, C chord. Dominant, G, B, D, G chord. Subdominant, F. F, A, C, F chord. And chords are as easy as that. Once you grasp how to build a chord, one, three, five, one meaning the note that you start on. So if it is um, called G chord, G is one. Then three, five. Okay, if it's F chord, F's one, so one, two, three, four, five. Other like that, F, A is the third, C is the fifth. And of course, going backwards, down to the tonic, the first chord, C, number one, E, and you build your chord up like that. C chord, G chord, F chord. So many songs are what people call in the music profession three chord wonders. There's thousands of songs, thousands, that are just simply three chords in the entire song. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the Beatles music um, are just three chords. Um, they enhance them a little bit 
by adding sevenths and sixths and minor sevenths and things like that. But um, essentially, three chords, um, once you grasp the idea of three chords, just in the C major scale, you can then move it to other scales like we talked about last week with the, the scale and the tone, tone, semitone and how they work. You can literally move them around all the different keys and it's the same process um, of one, three, one, three, five. Um, stepping up across here, you can also hear, that's the first chord, the tonic. Then we've, we've just literally locked my fingers in a position there and just moved them up one. We have a D minor chord. You can hear the tone is different. C major, which are really sort of really bright keys. Major, minor. It has quite a, a different tone, almost like a sad sort of sound to it. Then the next one, E minor. And then we're to our fourth chord, the F, subdominant. G chord, the dominant. The A minor chord, and then the seventh, which is almost like a diminished chord in a way. It's um, not one that we use a lot. And then, of course, you back up to C again, but just C, G, an octave higher. So it literally moves up the keys. If you have a keyboard, you can sort of lock your fingers in that position, lift because it's all just spaced apart. One, one, three, five, one, three, five. Okay. Uh, and that's how chords are formed. Um, those ones I've just played today are in the scale or the key of C major. So that is literally running from C up to the C. Like what we did last week with putting the, the two oct, the two C's together to get the octave of C. So, C, E, G, C chord, G, B, D, G chord, F, A, C is F chord. And really, once you get used to playing or hearing those chords over the, the octave of C, it just repeats itself, because it's just a music pattern, like the black keys, two black, three black, two, three, two, three. It's the same thing. C to C, then C to C, C to C, C to C, and going backwards. We've got C to C to C to C, and it's the same pattern over and over and over and over. Um, so as I said before, once you grasp those chords um, and get used to how quickly they are, because it's not difficult. Once you go over it a few times and just memorize a few things, um, it's not really as difficult as you might think it is. And then once you go from there, um, put in the chords, you then you know, make up a melody, a song, and then put the chords underneath that to fill that out with the harmony, the, the chord um, sound underneath the melody and then that steps through to if you've written words a poem or something like that it's a matter of then working out the words and a, you know bah, 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 bah. Um, working out a song a melody part to fit the words that you've written then of course with the chords underneath to support the melody and fill it all out and that's it you've got yourself a song easy as that Welcome to Music Elements. Now, after learning about uh, octaves, also about uh, the naming of notes and the timing, rhythm, um, now we start putting things together a little bit more um, and moving towards harmony, moving towards um, actually stepping through to songwriting, essentially. But first of all, working out what harmony is and what sounds good and what doesn't sound too good at all. So, what we learnt last time, I'm um, just recapping a few little things. Um, middle C on the piano, for instance. Um, and we're stepping through the musical alf alphabet. Um, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, back to C again. One octave. Oct, meaning eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Going back down, C, B, A, G, F, E, D, C, which is one octave below the other C. 
okay? And then up an octave. So I actually have three C's playing. You can, you can also hear that they sound great together, and they should because they're all the same note. They're just pitched an octave higher. Um, now taking that from what we also did in the last tutorial, where we were building the chords, um, just in the key of C major, C major scale, um, the first, like we said, C chord, where we start on C, we add the third note above C, then the fifth note. We have C chord. Um, F chord, we start on F. We add third note above, A, and the fifth note. One, two, three, four, five. F, A, C forms F chord. Same with a G chord, G, B, and D. We start on G, third above G, one, two, three, four, five, fifth above G, play them together, G, B, D, and then we have G chord. C chord, F chord, G chord are the three primary chords out of C major, C major scale, or the key of C major. Um, and that will work the same with any key. So if we've played something in, say, the key of um, G major, G to G, you'll see it has a black note, an F sharp, then moves to the G. So you will have to include, if there's an F, it would actually be played F sharp. So G chord, we'll start on G, G, B, D, get the three together. Um, C chord, C, E, G. And D chord, D, F, which needs to be the sharp, not the white note, the black note. And then A, you end up with D chord. So G, C, and D are the three primary chords from G major scale. Now keeping that theory or that um, sort of method going, there's a lot of maths you'll find in music, um, you can basically play any chord out of any key, any scale, um, you can quite easily work out the chords. So, moving on to harmony and what sounds good, what doesn't sound good. <laughs> um, we do know that if you play two notes side by side, as close as you can get, um, we did this in one of the other earlier tutorials, um, what's called a tone, where there's a note in the middle, a tone, you can see that you can play a note in between. A semitone is the closest distance that two notes can get to each other. So C and C sharp. You can't play another note in the join, in the crack there between the two keys. So C and C sharp, C sharp and D. You can hear that doesn't sound really good. It certainly won't hit the top 40 music charts. Um, and you can hear there's a clash. Okay? That's a semitone. Same with the tone. That's not all that great either. Okay? Now if I was to play C chord down here, C, E, G, and then was to play something like that, sound really good at all. <laughs> um, and that's harmony. That's actually bad harmony. <laughs> doesn't sound great at all. So what it is, it's working out the tone, the sound that blends in and sounds great with whatever chords, the, the, the backing chords that are underlying the melody that, that we're playing. Okay. Now if we have C, E, and G down there, C, E, and G, C, E, and G, anywhere is going to sound great because that's the notes that are forming the chord. So if I have C, E, G as a C chord and play a C, sounds great. Play an E, sounds good. Play a G, sounds great. Play the C an octave higher. Play the E an octave higher. They sound great because it's in harmony and you can hear that all C, E and G sounds great. Now if I was to play the G chord, which is a G, B, D, and a G, B or D up here, it all blends in and harmonizes with each other. If I was to play a wrong note, like which we would consider to be a wrong note, you listen. 
to what happens. That doesn't sound too good. However, what it's sounding like and what it is creating are different types of sound, different types of harmony. We then start having, um, for instance, like a seventh chord or a sixth chord or a ninth or a minor starting to, to develop um, <clears throat> from C again. If I was to play an A, it doesn't quite sound too out of place. It doesn't blend in with the C, G, but it doesn't really... If you move it to a different note as part of a melody, it actually blends in and sounds pretty good. So if we then start adding the notes, putting it into a melody where it's flowing on to the next note, the next note, the next tone, the next sound. You can hear that it doesn't sound too bad. So there are notes that will sound um, really bad that will definitely not work. As you can hear. <laughs> um, but there are others that um, that are not, in this case, C, E, or G, but they do blend in and they do harmonize to a degree with whatever the chords, whatever the chord structure might be. So keeping that now in mind, if you've got in the key of C, C major, all the C, C, And you've got C chord, any C, E, or G is going to work. Okay? And then if you move to a G chord, any G, B, or D is going to sound great. An F chord, any F, A, C is going to sound great. Back to C chord again, C, E, G. Okay? And it will all blend together and it'll sound really good. So if you've written uh, like a small poem or something like that, some words, um, some lyrics, um, you can actually start now to sort of put the lyric um, down on a piece of paper, grab some music manuscript paper. I'll put a post up um, of manuscript paper if you'd like to then just print that out. Um, so you've got a few sheets or you can grab some from your local music store. Um, you can then actually start to sort of rule it up, put the treble clef for the melody, put the bass clef and rule them all up, and then you can have the chord symbols, if you like, just C, G, F written down in the left hand in the bass clef chord area, if you like, or you can write it as a chord symbol just above a five line treble clef at the front, and but you can then sort of start to pencil in some of the notes. Um, of a chord, you can hear there F A C, but I've got an E in the middle, which is not part of an F chord. But it sounds pretty good. It actually creates a seventh, major seventh chord, to a minor seventh. So it's just blending the notes with the harmony, the chords you've got in the background. And then, and then playing, writing the notes that will harmonize with it. They'll be in tune with it. And if you use the same, what we call chordal notes, you can't go wrong. You really can't. If you've got a C, E, G in your chord, you've got a C, E, G up here. It's going to sound great. As a quick example, so C chord, C and G. And then we go to F chord, which is F, A, C. We've got an A in the melody. And back to C chord. And then G, C, G chord, C. So you can hear 
hear how it all blends together. So maybe try something like that for this week, working on some of the notes. If you're thinking, how do I play a keyboard when I don't have a keyboard? You can actually download um, a free piano to your iPad, um, iPhone, things like that. Um, and you can just play along on it. Um, there's one called Virtuoso, I think is the name of it. And um, it's actually a really good piano sound. Sounds great through headphones. Um, but there's lots of free apps like that where you can download a keyboard with um, like a guitar sound, a flute sound, um, an organ sound. Uh, and there's lots of um, piano apps as well. So you can have a piano keyboard on your iPad or iPhone um, and just ding, ding, ding and play away on the keys. Okay, so plenty of things to learn out of this tutorial. Rewind it, replay it, and go over and over and over it. And don't forget um, the Music Elements um, Live um, that we have, where you can jump on and ask questions. Okay. Get harmonizing, guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>
just hear how the ambience and the, the, the tone and that of um, a major and a minor chord um, are just yin and yang, it's totally different. Um, <clears throat> so if you're starting to do some songwriting, I would definitely suggest start off writing songs in a major key using our three, three chords, C, F and G, and then develop the other chords are in between. So literally, if you use your three fingers, if you've got a keyboard, C, E, G, right? And then we're stepping up. D, F, A is D minor. So D on the bottom, add the third, add the fifth. The next one is E, E, G, B. E minor. Next one, F, A, C. Next one, G, B, D, G chord we've done. Next one, A, C, E, A minor. The next one, leave it out. <laughs> it's like a diminished chord, it's a bit weird. So leave out the seventh one, okay? So it's um, basically just putting it all together, okay? So you have your song, C major, just write it from C to C. <clears throat> and just play your solid chord, block chord, down the bottom here, C, E, G, okay? There's your C chord. Any C, E or G you play on the right hand in the melody is going to sound great because the harmony underlying tone of C, E and G is already sitting here. Any C, E, G, doesn't matter where it is, is going to sound great. <laughs> um, F chord, F, A, C, any F, any A, any C, it's going to sound great. G, G, B, D. Any, any G, B, D is going to sound great. Okay? So it's just a matter of sitting there, 4 4 times sitting to treble clef, bass clef, rule up the, the music stuff, C chord, and coming up with a melody if you've got some words, write them down. Say one line over 10 times to yourself, out loud, or often quite, quite good. Close your eyes, saying it out is even better because it opens up your hearing senses more. Um, and say the words of your first line of your poem or lyrics that you've written over several times. Now while you're saying that, lightly, if you've got a keyboard or guitar, play the chord, um, lightly play like the C chord and then just say the words. Say the words over of that first line then do it with the second line and maybe just change the chord on the second line to a G. Now you're saying the second ver the second line of the lyrics or of your poem, whatever you've written. Okay, then go back and do the first line again with the C chord. Say the words and just start sort of just playing two, three, four, then the F chord, one, two, three, then back to the C chord, one, and you, for the third and the fourth line, uh, for the third line, then maybe the fourth line you go back to C. Always start and end on the C chord. So that's the C chord, your first part, first lot of words. C chord is your last line or half of the last line of your lyrics. Depends what your lyrics are or what your poem is or, and what it's about too. So as you know, all music, all songs is totally different. So if you're putting words to music, um, Write out the words, space them out a little bit, look for the syllables, <laughs> the syllables um, in words. Um, P and no has three, P and no, it depends how many times your chin hits your hand if you say a syllable. <laughs> you can break it up, you can put a little dash between the syllables in a word if you wanted to do that. There's lots of different ways you can do it. Many songwriters, um, all songwriters do things differently. You know, what works for someone might not work for someone else and vice versa. So it's just working on the, the chord, the underlying fundamental harmony, chords that are playing. Mix it in with whatever melody you can, that you're working with, with your poem or the lyrics you've got. And then literally putting it together um, to see what you end up with. But as I said before, major chords, a bright sound, but if you want that minor that sad, if you've got sad lyrics, put the minor chords in, use them. I love minor chords. I love adding ninths and thirteenths and all sorts of weird things to my chords um, and getting different different sorts of harmonies and, and all sorts of 
and sounds. And particularly with the years um, I was writing a lot of music for orchestras and arranging for orchestras and things, coming out with different tones and things that like a string orchestra would play, which is sort of what I've got up here, you know? Different types of sounds and chords. depends you know and then playing finger picking guitar or something like that you're going to have different sound a different tonal experience to the way your ears hear and pick up the the sound frequencies and the way that you and your brain processes a different chord or a different tone what might sound um, good to me and the different harmonies and things sound a bit weird to someone else because they they haven't heard the those tones and the ninth chords and thirteenths but um, one underlying element that uh, you really need to take on board is have fun that's all it is enjoy what you're doing enjoy the music you're creating um, enjoy any music you're listening to and have fun at writing and composing music, writing your lyrics um, and then putting it all together. It might get frustrating, you might want to tear up the pages every now and again, but um, seriously, have fun with what you're doing. Um, because if you're not having fun, what's the point to writing music or playing an instrument? You know? So make sure the number one thing is enjoy what you do. So um, thanks guys, thanks for listening again to another Music Elements. I used to say in all of my motivational videos and motivation work I was doing many years ago, a little saying that I sort of would end all my videos on. And um, with music composing and that sort of thing, like what I just said about it being fun and enjoying it, um, I think this saying's really good, so um, I'll say it. <laughs> May the rest of your life be the best of your life and love what you're doing. So. Until the next one, bye. Hi, my name's Paul Kenny, and uh, Scales, love them or hate them, You've got to play them. So here we go. Here's a bit of a brief intro into playing scales and getting the most out of your time practicing them. Here we go. Scales, as I said, love them or hate them. You've got to do them. You've got to practice them. It helps with your dexterity and feeling your way around the keyboard and knowing where the keys are and also about how, how certain keys, major or minor, how things sound. So today we'll just be working on C major scale across one octave. Um, if you're doing an exam, piano exam or keyboard exam, they would normally be over two octaves. So today we'll just be doing from C to C, one octave C major scale. A major scale consists of a certain pattern of tones and semitones, which allows you then to literally just build the scale. And using this particular pattern, you can build any major scale. C major scale. This consists of a tone, then another tone, then a semitone, then a tone, a tone, a tone, and another semitone. Eight notes, five fingers. We have a little problem. So when you're playing scales, you have to develop moving your thumb underneath the hand when you're playing. It's a kind of magic. So when you're playing, that we have one, two, three, Okay, so the fingers are one, two, three, four, five. Just like when you're reading music, you'll have little numbers on some of the notes. Um, so one, two, three. The thumb then moves underneath to play F, G, A, B, C. One, two, three. Thumb goes under. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, coming back down, it's the opposite. Five, four, three, two, one. Three, two, one. Four, three, two, one, three, four, five. Five, four, three, two, one, three.
three, tucking over the top. Three, two, one. Okay. Thumb underneath to the F. And then straight up. So it's three, then five. A lot of scales follow that exact same finger pattern. Some are different, of course, um, and it depends when the black notes come in to where the hand falls. When you're playing a scale, if you start off with the concept that you never put your thumb on a black key, um, you'll be heading in the right direction. So we have C major, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Okay? Some of the tricks to playing scales, and this might sound a little silly, um, when you're practicing scales, play them as slowly as you possibly can. And you might play them as slowly as you possibly can for months. When you're also playing them, make sure the key goes all the way down to the base, to the bottom. That's what we call all the way down to the key bed. Don't just half press it. Um, on a real piano, you do have to press it quite a way down to get the strike and the force for the hammer to hit the string. Um, on a keyboard, you might find you only have to press it halfway down before it makes a sound. Make sure you press it all the way to the bottom of the key bed, okay? Keeping your fingers curved in the right hand shape, like that. Pretend you're holding a tennis ball. That will allow you space to move your thumb underneath, like that, when you're playing. So, playing it nice and slow. Make sure the key goes all the way to the bottom of the key bed as you are playing. Play the top note once and then you just return. So you come back down again. If you have a metronome, set it on 80 beats per minute and play along with that. And you might play along with that for a month three months at 80. Then just slowly click it up by, say, 10 at a time, 80, 90, then 100, 110, and so on. Um, keep in mind finger shape, hand, fingers curved, hand shape, and that passing of the thumb underneath. So you can get that moving quickly, and then coming back down, and the third going over the top. Enjoy your scales. Practice them for 10 minutes a day. If you really love scales, practice them even longer. So there it is about scales. A quick few minutes on how scales work. Um, a couple of uh, important notes to remember is hand shape. Um, you will never play scales properly playing them like that. Um, you have to play on the pointy, the tip part of your finger. Okay. You can get more force and control by playing like that rather than playing flat fingered when, you, when, you're, when you're playing them. Um, and keeping your hand nice and curved, just like you're holding a tennis ball or something like that. So you like that and it will allow you then the space to then do the, the magic where the thumb tucks underneath to give you another five notes. So remember, three, then five. Thumb tucks under, thumb tucks under, up to the next C. Only play the top note once, so it's just, and then the bottom note once if you're going to keep going back and forth. And enjoy your music. Enjoy playing. Love what you do. I'm Paul Getty. Bye.